for those of us who had the uh, privilege of knowing and uh, working with, with Harold, uh, he was a uh, wonderful colleague who was a dedicated scholar and a, a wonderful teacher. And uh, the, the great story, of, one of the stories of his life, of course, is that uh, he taught here at Portland State University until uh, a few uh, weeks before he died in uh, the year 2000. So we're honored this evening uh, to have this uh, lecture uh, as a way of, of remembering him and the department. I also want to say that this, this is a department that has a very distinguished uh, record and continues that. I'm very proud of the kind of the leadership that this department uh, gives to, to this university uh, and with its national and international reputation. And that will be represented this evening. So I welcome you, and it's my pleasure now to introduce one of the wonderful colleagues of uh, Dr. Vauder, and that is Dr. John Walker, who has been here a couple of years himself. Uh, John, please. Uh, 
That's in Peter Linder's shop for many years, and he does it very well. Uh, hopefully this has convinced you. I do want to make one personal statement about him. Just it, it says something more, probably more about me than it does him. Charles Kindleberger at MIT wrote a textbook called International Economics. It was first published in 1953. After seven or eight editions, it became Kindleberger and Lindert. Then it became Lindert and Kindleberger. Then it became Lindert. Now it's Lindert and or then it was Lindert and Pugel, then Pugel and Lindert, and the 2004 edition is just Pugel. <laughs> Still, Peter managed to keep going for another 30 years, a truly great textbook. Now, handing a book off to another professor is not uncommon. Keeping it successful for another 30 years is almost unheard of. Okay? Now, the personal note from Professor Walker, it is my opinion that Charles Kimmelberger is one of the six or seven greatest American economists of the 20th century. And he said, Peter Linder is a great economist then he must be a great economist. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to him. surprise you that this is still big in the year 2010 because this is just what we went through on the health care reform front. This is their kind of issue about the public sector in a mixed economy. Um, delighted to have uh, this opportunity to pursue Vader and Walker kinds of questions. This issue is being debated in Portland State right now. Uh, I wasn't able to get quite off the web quite the right photo that I wanted, so I repaired to my own home campus. Uh, the issues are the same. Tuition has gone up, is going up 39% for next year uh, because the state uh, is slashing. 
uh, you know the theme. And uh, there's an issue about public versus private in the universities today as there never was before. Not just nationally, but also in other countries too. There's an example from Cambridge where though what's happening to them is a little more gradual, it's going to get bad in, in uh, the British universities as well because um, their deficit is as bad as ours. Uh, and in their case, it's a national issue. Okay, those issues. Now, I wanna start off with some thoughts on how a higher education should be supplied, what really works. Now, this is a different kind of social sector from others. So let me start with my first paragraph and then I'll lead into that issue of why it's different from others. First, competition is good, keeps suppliers and demanders on their toes, and campuses should face that, as should faculty and students and applicants. I think at the university level, for example, faculty should be forced to face you know, competitive and evaluative pressures like teaching evaluations. College students do not abuse that privilege. Some will use it to either fawn in favor of the professor or to trash him, but that's, you know, usually they're on the mark. And when they criticized me, I thought, oh, that was right, you know, and I'll have to make some adjustments, etc. It's a competitive mechanism. We do that in America more than in other countries. That is to say, some other countries may have what look like teaching evaluations. However, in, the, in America, it particularly affects the actual promotion prospects of the faculty, especially if you're like the worst <laughs> or the best. <laughs> At those two ends of the spectrum, it, it actually does matter. Um, in between, well, less. Campuses should face competition with each other. That's good. See, this is classic econ principles. Oh, markets, you know, supply, demand, competition. Um, and I'm gonna argue that that does apply here with that second paragraph. Let me explain how I contrast this with some other aspects of uh, the role of government in the economy and in the social sectors. You see, we tonight are at one end of the spectrum of all the social sectors that I've written about. John has referred to uh, the book that I uh, labored on most. Of all the different social sectors, like in this case, education, there's higher education, primary, secondary, uh, pensions, public health care, public housing, unemployment compensation, flat out welfare, all of those. Of all those sectors in which government must intervene to some extent or other, because these are not classic market sectors, the one for which market competition is still working best is in fact higher education. You can make the strongest case for it here. That will be the opposite of the sectors on which I wrote most in the past, which is the other ones for which the market fails most clearly. In the case of America, most clearly uh, of those, that would be public health. Uh, the clear Achilles heel, the case where just ordinary voluntary markets have well-known inherent uh, problems that require at least some kind of intervention. Okay, so tonight you're having me talk not exactly uh, the way I've uh, done so much in the past on the need to uh, have government intervene thoroughly in a really failing sector, uh, but rather to uh, talk about the role of government in one that has some value to the ordinary competitive private mechanisms. Okay, and there's evidence to back up what I said about the advantages of competition in universities. And here, are, uh, here is a reference on the screen to one of the readings. By the way, I give you a set of them on the handout uh, of a few that I, I thought would be of interest to you. Some are gonna be for the economists among you. Others are quite readable. If you see some, the article in Journal of Economic Perspectives, uh, rest assured, even if you're not an econ grad student or faculty, that the Journal of Economic Perspectives is the only journal in economics that is constrained to write in English. Uh, and it's, it's really very good, uh, so you will like it, um, that particular um, art, uh, article and others in it. Okay, um, one uh, study has been showing that, for example, more autonomy from state government, therefore less protection against competition and less sort of throttling will lead to uh, better research output, output, which is what they were able to measure. Uh, government control over the budgets and faculty salaries, if that's less, uh, the university seems to do better. That's an example of what is still 
a literature that's just beginning statistically to support what I is my strong intuition uh, on the value of competition in this particular sector. And that helps to explain why uh, certain competitive, uh, more competitive university areas are, perform better than others. The U.S. better than Europe. We can see that most clearly in research. In the case of teaching, it's hard to, I mean, you can't even compare a good teacher at Portland State versus a good teacher at Eugene. I don't, you know, there's no metric that allows you to compare across campuses for how good these teachers are or not. Uh, it's even harder across countries. But uh, on the research front where you can get these measures, tonight I'm talking about the one social sector where the Americans are just way ahead of everybody else and they just beat everybody up hollow. And if you were a uh, really smart European scholar, you'd much rather get to the United States as fast as you could. Uh, this is a U.S. advantage, unlike the other sectors that I've written about before. Why Colorado? for example, with a bit more autonomy, is doing better than Wyoming or New Mexico in having developed a uh, prominent research university. I mean, you, know, there's, you can talk about city size, the nearby city size and other controls, but basically this is one of the factors that they find. Why Sweden is so much better than Italy. In Italy, uh, professors are protected public servants with the top slots uh, appointed by political connections. Um, and uh, it doesn't work. Uh, Sweden has much more competition for research grants, et cetera, among its faculty. I, I see a competitive side to those differences. Okay, so in terms of this kind of terminology that we've been hearing this year in the healthcare debate, you definitely want in higher education a public option. But public option, not exactly the sole provider. We don't want a national university. And the Americans never had it. That was practically guaranteed by we, the fact that this nation was created in such a, uh, you know, a fragile federal um, uh, compact. Though I note on the screen, uh, by the way, the, the idea did come up of having a national university that would kind of dominate over the others with uh, major government uh, protection. George Washington liked that. So did Thomas Jefferson later. Jefferson liked many things in education. Uh, they got shot down, uh, both of them, as did Jefferson's attempt to have full funding for all public schools. That also got shot down by his native Virginia. But even if they had succeeded in this national university, it would have been something that would still have had to compete with the state universities. Every state was, des was destined to set up its own university. The Americans were always big on education. In military academies, same deal. They compete with each other. Uh, with, today, they compete with ROTC on the, the separate non-military campuses, etc. That's good. That's good. I, I, I think the, uh, the case for that stands up well. Now, more specifically to who should pay and to my title, uh, it's easy to say that taxpayers and government have to pay part of the bill. It's not reasonable to say we should just leave this to private individuals. You go ahead if you want to pay for a university education and get the returns in terms of a better job, it's all up to you. That's not reasonable. We know two main reasons why that's not, and the public has to be involved. First, capital markets fail when it comes to education. A private lender will not lend you the money for your education to collect it later on from your higher pay 25 and 30 years from now. Uh, the risks to them are too great. There's the risks about your performance. There's the risks about your not defaulting and fleeing, etc. Uh, it doesn't work. Private markets have never been able to solve that. Somebody needs to get the gains, as a financier would say, of diversification and capture the entire portfolio of paying for everybody so that the risks to this grand lender, I'll, you for the moment call them a lender, um, are all spread out. Now, that has to be somebody, who, some grand financier who can borrow at a really low interest rate and uh, get revenues later on, a repayment from the graduates as they earn more than they would have without the degree. That's got to be the government. Who could do it better than the government? The government is able to borrow at this really low rate of interest. It stands over everybody. It's so clearly able to get its money back in the aggregate from all those college grads across the state or land that, in fact, it could give grants 
flat out grants, and that's a loan. Because, as I'll come back to and harp on near the end of the talk, the government's going to get a rate of return from you. Because with your extra earnings, you're going to end up paying more taxes. And even if it wasn't called a loan, it, it behaves like it. And uh, definitely government. To that, so um, if there anywhere, anyone were to try to mount kind of a libertarian or oh, let the markets handle university education uh, argument, uh, that's easily defeated. And in fact, uh, this point should be so obvious that uh, the political process uh, got it right for most countries recently, though for much of human history earlier, uh, they didn't. Okay. Uh, second, the second reason why is what we call, the economists call externalities. Um, and I'm going to come to a figure that you actually find I failed to give you in the handout, but uh, you'll see it on the screen. A lot of the gain from private education accrues to the student. Let me stop there at that comma and look, at, look ahead at this figure A that I have now. I hope it shows up pretty well. The lines look a little thin. Eh, pretty well. Let me tell you about the axes. Sure, you get more pay when you get your university education. There was an article in the Oregonian which featured individuals for whom it wasn't true. Oh, my husband's looking around, he got his degree, he can't seem to find a job, the economy's so bad, etc. But please, uh, relative to not having the degree, uh, in, and over the long haul, uh, he, he's obviously a winner for this, as the Oregon, Oregonian went on to say, even though uh, most of the article features, oh, people who get degrees can't get jobs, gee, is the, do, the headline said, is the degree really worth it, sort of thing which is kind of a, a trashy throwaway title. Of course it is. Look at the vertical axis here on the left, which is the one that refers to college, where you're seeing 0 0.3, 0 0.4, so 0.6 up there toward the top means you get a 60% higher average rate of pay with the university than with just high school. So it was early on. Uh, interesting dip at mid-century that we could go into the history of. But the real point for us right now is look at that rise since then. Uh, you've been hearing about how college costs more. Uh, as the bumper sec sticker says, try ignorance. Uh, but the, the rate of pay, even just privately, is clearly soaring. There's something in the economy in this last half century, more than at some other times, is jacking up the reward for the skills that go with the university degree. So yes, it pays, for sure. And now let me go back to that sentence in the, under externalities there. Still. A lot of what is actually gained from your education, this would be especially true of primary and secondary, but we're going to talk about university here, spills over to the rest of society. It's not just captured by you and your employer. The rest of society gains from your knowledge as well. We've long known that, and there are more econometric studies that are now kind of quantifying these externalities. They're extremely difficult to measure, so I can't give you a number for how big these are. We just have to know that they are there. There's every reason to believe that they're not declining over time. So to get the incentives right for this reason number two externalities and the reason number one, which was the capital market, uh, the private capital market failure, you have to have the government uh, paying for part of the education. It just makes uh, completely good uh, economic sense. In fact, they already do. Obviously, at Portland State, but in the private colleges, they're paying for a large, the government and the taxpayers are paying for a large share of your education. We'll come to the, uh, those piles and piles of uh, donor money and the endowments of the privates that we are now scrambling as public universities to <laughs> try to imitate as best we can at the, la at the 11th hour. Uh, much of that money was contributed by the taxpayers. In history, I'm going to show you outright grants. But the real thing is um, the tax advantages of giving to it. You know, charitable deductions? You hear of charitable deductions, you might think, oh, you know, giving to, the, giving to CARE or a Red Cross or something. How about Princeton? <laughs> uh, the, all that money uh, does have uh, tax advantages. So in effect, we, the taxpayers, are paying for those donations to the private universities already, just like you pay for the, one of my favorite examples, the, the rich home in Malibu that slides into the ocean. Well, we pay for about a third of that, right? Because they can write it off. 
You know, so it's the, a similar kind of thing with the charitable deductions. Private universities. So the principle is of uh, government and in being involved is universally practiced and now uh, increasingly accepted. Okay, but how much? Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. You know, I promised in the title I'd tell you. Well, you know, I'm going to have to weasel a bit. I'm going to have to kind of walk around the answer a bit with some history and some principles here and uh, leave some of the rest of this to you. Uh, there's huge issues here like how much uh, in a private university, how much in a public university, how much for in-state, out-of-state, etc. Uh, this is not easily quantified. Economists have never been able to come up with what's that right share, the optimal share. They can't even correctly give you the actual re full rate of return of the rest of society because they can't measure those externalities. But we can, and I'll make a, something of this later, at least get a lower bound on what the rest of society is getting here and what therefore should be their, uh, the share that they in some sense pay for um, in, from the, the more measurable things that I'll come to. Okay. Now, I want to show you the, that this is, as in Harold Potter's work, etc., largely a question of economic history. It certainly is. To set the stage for that, I want to tell you some of the principles about the way in which U.S. university finance has been working. And, as I say, it will show you again that history has a huge role to play. Okay. First, not so obviously related to history, private universities are mostly nonprofits. Uh, they don't pay, this affects their behavior and their tax status, so there's tax advantages of not being a profit. Most of them, most of the private ones are not for profit. There are a few uh, commercial for profit universities. So we, here we have um, DeVry uh, on Barnes Road near Sunset Transit Center. We have, let's see who else is local, is um, Phoenix. University of Phoenix is here. In California and Nevada, uh, something called National University is actually a big deal, but it's not National University, it's National University, uh, and they make money. Uh, my son goes to something else with a completely different name where he's paying a, a for-profit uh, institution, one of my sons. And, yeah, they exist. They have trouble competing against these nonprofits because the nonprofits have their special tax advantages and they have a head start of two centuries or something like that. Uh, and it's very hard to compete. Uh, and that leads me to B, which is that private endowment buildup from alumni and others. This is so huge. Uh, I don't, can't remember how many billion Harvard is worth. They were worth so many at the peak of the market in 2007 when they were big into hedge funds that Congress began to have investigations into possibly revoking the nonprofit status of Harvard, Yale, and other leading uh, campuses. The uh, financial events since 2007 took care of that problem. <laughs> Harvard and Stanford actually had to tighten their belts for a while, etc., and the uh, Congress kind of dropped the subject. But uh, huge buildups, and th those will continue for sure. Okay. You see my side question. Why is this such an American thing? I mean, who else, in what other country does this happen? Now, Oxford and Cambridge might be an analogy because they have these monster private, they have had these proper monster private endowments. So they might look the same, except for the start and the end of the history for Harvard and Cambridge. At the start of the history, they got those private endowments from the throne. Henry VIII uh, took the church lands away and uh, gave them to friends who approved of his divorce and had other good political connections. And this included uh, the Trinity College, Cambridge, and all the other you know, colleges where you go and drink the port and Madeira and sherry uh, at high table, etc. cetera. Uh, that was originally government, but it has been private for centuries. Until now, and it's uh, heavily dependent on national money. Um, the subsidies again, you see, saw the complaint of the Cambridge students uh, back in an early slide. Uh, they are dependent on public money now because some of their private endowment got taxed across the 20th century. Okay, so one con a consequence of this, uh, there's two co consequences that I'll simply uh, look at in order here and then I'll go on to these uh, fascinating uh, recent data about them. Top private universities subsidize students more than state universities. That's correct. I'll come to that. And therefore, you can see the other consequence, hey, it 
kind of does pay to go some, to the, some of those top tuition universities. This is a hard thing. Uh, econometrically, this is very difficult to prove. But uh, pretty good work has been done by Ron Ehrenberg, labor economist, specialists in the economic, specialist in the economics of higher education at Cornell, and an administrator of Cornell University, and the, kind of a, one of the masterminds behind their fund drives. Uh, he has shown uh, that this, yeah, you basically sort of looks like you get your money back by going to the major uh, privates. Okay, let's look at some of those data. Now, you have these on the handout, uh, and my thanks to Rositska and others for uh, making these available, uh, even in color, I believe. Now, some, I've highlighted the uh, curve that I want you to look at most, which is for the, uh, for the most selective colleges, their average subsidy per student. What do I mean, average subsidy per student? Well, first you have to estimate what is the actual cost per year of educating a college student. And that curve will relate to the tippy-top mixture of private and public uh, most selective colleges. Well, how you measure it is tough. But you've got some fine print there that you might be able to make out on the handout where she, uh, in this case, Caroline Hoxby uh, at Stanford, who's doing a new book on competition among colleges that will be in, come out in a couple years, I think. And she measures the things that are most related to instruction, et cetera. She keeps aside the money spent on research. Get rid of that. Get rid of some other things. She's trying to capture most of what is spent on instruction. It's really tough. Like, there are certain overhead activities, like administration. Is the administration there for the research, for the instruction? Well, you know, it's, there are accounting divisions, but it's very hard to measure. Nonetheless, she's made a good try at it. I should say in all of this, that all of these subsidies, by the way, exclude all the capital costs and the value of the annual value to you of using the place. So what we are sitting in here is not counted. Uh, you know, uh, PS, the state does not charge PSU rent for this, I think, <laughs> and I hope. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that would be added to the subsidy, ditto at Harvard, et cetera. OK, now look at those subsidies that she's got. Uh, now, these are deflated by the cost of living index. The actual numbers in current dollars would have been more dramatically different. But from 1967, uh, $6,000 subsidy, now up to $75,000 subsidy. Now, you, what, you're used to looking at a, a graph like this for a highly selective college and say, oh my gosh, that, I know what that graph is. That's the cost of tuition that we pay. No, this is the cost of what you don't pay and you do get. Um, you know, the SATs and the great averages are worth something <laughs> if, they, uh, if they work out right. Uh, so uh, that's the subsidy. And it's way above what the ordinary, uh, the rest of the ranks get below that top 1%, as you can kind of see from the graph. Others don't give such subsidies. And so from figure B, we get figure C, which dramatizes the same point. This is that same figure where we now look at, after the subsidy, what do you actually pay? We take the subsidy out, and what do you pay as a share of the cost of instruction per student at your campus? And I've highlighted the one I care about most. Uh, I should pause and say that her graph, I can't quite get, uh, it doesn't show all the same trends as something I'll show you in a figure D, I think it is. Uh, later on, there's, there's a different series that comes out of uh, Washington. That's not quite the same. It doesn't look like it behaves entirely the same as hers, but I think uh, she's on the right track here from what I've uh, read by other authors. OK, for that, it was most selective colleges. Back in the 1960s, oh, I'm sorry, most selective defined by most selective at the start of this game, which was back in 1962. So that's the usual IVs. And Reed, Reed College might have been there. I don't know uh, who she had in that group. Of those back then, yeah, 40% you might have paid for yourself. The tuition looked high. The other 60% was paid by somebody else. In the most selective colleges, oh, and that's a mixture of private and public. So that has Berkeley in it, et cetera. But it still excludes the subsidy you got from the, the land and buildings and laboratories and things. That's not included here. So you got subsidized even more. You paid even a lower share than what we're showing. And now that has dropped to something like 20%, which is below the average figure that we're going to look at at the end of things today for the average public 
university. So you get, as, you get slightly more subsidy in the top 1% of universities, public, private mix, a lot of privates up there like Stanford, than you get in the average uh, public university. That's weird, and that is because of those, the incredible dynamics of how those endowments build up and how they seem to relate to what I'm going to go on to, which is kind of the uh, weird dynamics of selectivity. So I wonder, and I've, I've been online, and the, uh, unfortunately the national data sources are not able to help me here, and I haven't asked Coxby if this is under sample. Would you actually pay a lower share of your college expenses at Reed than at Portland State? That might be true. I don't know how the numbers actually work out. It could be true. But you can see because of that, the intensity they heap onto the, uh, the, you know, the class size and the intensity of instruction, et cetera. Uh, that's the interesting uh, possible uh, relationship there. Now, why? How does that work? Well, first of all, there's this strange peer effect mechanism. Uh, you see some jargon at the top here, which is uh, how some economists have referred to this, uh, Michael Rostiel, the co-author. It's called cons customer input technology. The people that are my customers are going to affect my product. They are going to be my, you know, the quality of my product, and it's going to show. Okay, so here's a viable strategy. And as I say this, you might think of, oh, imagine I'm talking about a private university. I could also be talking about a flagship for a public, you know, like uh, UO. But say for a private university. You start off, tight, tighten up admissions admit uh, a bit. They don't admit as few as many students. Uh, this could pay off financially. How? Well, you become more selective. And it is publicized what really good students are going there. The teachers could be dull and worthless, but as long as you've got these other really great students there, that helps, you know. Um, and think of the dating service implications of, uh, of drawing from this, uh, this more selective pool, etc. Okay, so that improves the peer pool, and lo and behold, your US News and World Report rating jumps. Okay, that's one of the main ways that you make it jump. Pause for a side note before I come back to the theme. If you didn't know it, there's a lot of gaming in the US News and World Report ratings. Oh, this is a serious problem. Now, here's how, here's how to get Portland State's ratings up <laughs> fast for next year. First of all, of course, make, make uh, US News and World Report change their weights. And they, they do that because they get tired of the fact that the rankings are the same. They're not going to sell as many copies if they keep giving you the same rankings last year. The truth is the rankings don't change. But they've got to make it look like they're changing, like there's all this exciting action out there that you want to read about as parents or as student, uh, prospective students. So what they do, and uh, it could go for or against Portland State, is they change the weights sometimes. So one particular year, Caltech jumped out of uh, number 12 or something. They're number one, and that's the headline. And the next year, they're down to number eight. What did they do in Pasadena that year and the, and, and the next year? You know, well, the answer is they just fiddle the weights around to make it look interesting, see? Another way you can game it now, here's, uh, we, we had a uh, kind of a soul, we have, do you have retreats like in September? Uh, so we had one of our September retreats things uh, up, at, uh, up at Tahoe. And uh, we said, now how can we do this? We, I, I was supposed to speak about ratings and I did. Um, the first thing I said about ratings, uh, I tried to uh, ingest, take the high road and say, oh, this stuff is beneath us. We know the quality of our product. We're, we're above these rank things. However, <laughs> and then we, we get, seriously get into the angst that we all really feel about how the heck do we get our ratings up? Well, by luck, a uh, chancellor from Purdue was our guest. And he says, here's what I did. Purdue jumped 18 points. Here's how I did it. One of the weights in the rating is how many small classes do students get the advantage of? Okay. Okay, so here's what you do. You got Econ 1, or well, what's the principal's number? 201. You got Econ 201. Okay, here's what you do. And it's got the discussion sections. Okay. Define every discussion section as a separate class. Keep 17 people in it. Not 18, <laughs> not above, 17. Suddenly, Portland State has all this intimate instruction and it will show up in the data, right? And you will jump. Purdue did that. Uh, later, I, they, 
I think they got wise later, but you know, things, you can game this. Okay, now back to the US News uh, rating. Oh, I'm sorry, in some places, uh, fudge their SAT averages. I said, oh, I'm sorry, did we exclude students who are on probation? You know, <laughs> things like that, you know. Uh, there, there is press coverage on this, so. But okay, hey, it works, you know, you, and, and there's certainly whatever is the reality of the peer pool, pool will work. So there's more demand for your product. You can raise the tuition, be even more restrictive, and on the virtuous cycle goes. You could do that if you're a private college or even a public flagship. Now, is that good for society? We don't actually know that. I mean, you, haven't you faced this kind of, well, you, you do face this kind of question, for example, uh, allocating resources in, say, your own department, say, economics department. You could put uh, the faculty resources into a senior honors thesis with uh, just the five or six best students and make the other classes be more crowded, okay, or not. But what's the actual gain, social net gain here? Do we really, I mean, everybody goes around saying, oh, the, the top must be together and we must have, uh, you know, attention lavished on these few good people who interact with each other at the top brain center. I've never seen that measured. Uh, or could you have created just as much value added by, you know, making some other classes smaller? Things like that. So that, that, that's the side thing that I'm wondering about there. Then the, the fourth of those four features of uh, this kind of industry, gotta watch my time, is that the hierarchy of producers is really intense. Uh, Harvard, and, you know, Stanford is the only weird one in that they are as young as only 140 years old or so, and so they're the young upstart. But, you know, Harvard three centuries uh, and others, it's been that way for a long time. They're more durable than General Motors, another nonprofit institution. Um, now, since the 1960s, uh, they've gone on with this selectivity game, and it's gotten more and more intense. Hoxby's uh, fourth book to, in a couple years from now will be about this. The top ones have become more and more selective. The others have not. Uh, can't everybody be more selective? After all, there's a certain set of high school grads, and you know, so the, in the aggregate, it's got to come out the same. But uh, the top ones have become more selective. Uh, since the 1960s, why since then? Basically because of the information revolution in both directions. The universities know more about the applicants than they did in the past. All the applicants are now in the, same, the, the basic databases. And the applicants know more about the universities. Even if there were no US, US News and World Report, they would. Uh, they know all about the universities. So it's really a giant national market now. So the top places can get anybody from Albuquerque or Bozeman, et cetera, to apply, and uh, they know that, and that's the way the system is working. It didn't used to be true. I can remember uh, a grad school roommate of mine said, uh, okay, I'll, I'm sorry, let me use an example that is actually within one state, closer to home. So in Illinois, if you wanted to really go to the best, you would go to something like Knox college or something like that, you know, and if in Minnesota, you know, Carlton or St. Olaf for sure. Uh, but now there's this, this, this national traffic and that allows the top ones to be extremely selective. That may have reached its limits, as you have probably figured out and is uh, remarked here, because we've now gotten to a situation where the top schools has a, have a severe information problem. Even short of interviewing everybody, they would have a severe information problem. You want to admit people with top test scores and top grade averages, but grade inflation has put everybody up in the A or in California system A plus range because of this AP, you can get a 4.3 kind of thing. Um, so we have A plus averages and just a 4.0. And the universities are obviously bothered by the fact that just one teacher who didn't like you can nail you, right? That's it, you know, because that, that, that one B minus puts you down in the, uh, 33rd percentile or something like that uh, in some places. Uh, similarly with the SATs, there's just a lot of people pressing against the top, uh, especially at those, for those top institutions. Okay, now um, you see this hierarchy and this buildup of the funds over time, that leads me to the importance of the history, and let me tell you some of the history uh, very briefly, the field that uh, Harold Vader and John and I um, love so much. 
Now, it's of interest uh, in this question of what should the public uh, sector role be in paying for education is that they were there from the start. This is strange, because, but it is true of university education as it was true of K-12. Well, they didn't have grades, but as it was true of basic education. Way at the start, back in the colonies, the Americans, this country supposedly founded on hatred of George III and big government, spontaneously, without any national meeting about this, came up with ways locally to fund education out of taxes. And they did it from the start. They had many mechanisms that you see here. Uh, above all, tax exemptions. There have always been uh, tax exemptions in one degree or another for university earnings and property. They used to give them, in their colonial wisdom, uh, tax exemptions for professors. Here, here. Uh, we need to return to that. Uh, land endowments, big land endowments. Permanent money, uh, lottery receipts. We now do that for K through 12. Does Oregon have a education funded funding lottery? Huh? They do, okay, so do we. The money usually goes to the lottery operation itself, but there's supposedly some for education. And all these other kinds of gifts. Now, examples. In the early examples, as you may not know, until the late 19th century, America used tax money for religious education. That's also true, as I could have said in a separate discussion about K through 12. But it's true, it was true of uh, universities, certainly. Harvard um, wanted to train ministers from the start. It got a huge grant from the government of Massachusetts, back when it was a colony. And the later grants were private, so I don't want to make too much of this uh, gov early government grant point, because John Harvard, what he gave later on was an even bigger amount of money. Uh, the Unitarians came to take over. Yale's Congregationalists, similarly, were definitely feeding at the trough of state government in Connecticut. Connecticut was rich in revenues from land sales in particular, and uh, they wanted to be able to make Yale the place that would, interestingly, if you read that quote, it looks like they want to train them for work in the public sector and the religious sector. Um, things have changed, but uh, they, so they did. Columbia, similarly. It was, after all, King's College, and it was funded by the King of England and uh, he gave them the revenues from a lottery. William and Mary, Dartmouth, uh, Georgia, uh, many others. Uh, a lot of initial, interestingly, uh, public uh, funding for these top universities. Then we backed off because the vote began to spread, think of the Jacksonian era as a quick shorthand, toward ordinary rural men uh, at the time. And uh, they really, well, they had social gripes against uh, the elite universities, and so the states began shifting their subsidies to common primary schools. Probably a good thing for the development of the economy. You probably got a better return from subsidizing primary education. Uh, even though Harvard and others kept pleading for uh, further subsidies. But as they got weaned, a lucky thing for them on the rebound was being kicked out of state funds they also ended up slowly making more and more private their incorporation and their governance by boards of overseers and the like. So that in the end, they walked away with all that property. There was no further issue about what the state of Massachusetts or Connecticut owned in terms of the land and the buildings. It was theirs. And they were off and running. They also decided uh, to be more selective, and at that time that meant emphasizing the classics. Well, then we had uh, and we'll come to, I will come to the graph that you have uh, on what shares are paid for publicly and privately over the long sweep of American history. We have the famous 1862 Morrill Act, which set up all the land-grant colleges, sort of all, uh, the land-grant colleges, or at least a whole big wave of them. So in Oregon, there are these three that you, uh, you see here, and uh, a hint about their modern names. Uh, Portland State was not that early nor was my campus. Uh, we were the, we were only started, UC Davis started only in the early 20th century as a farm station for Berkeley uh, and, and things grew from there. Okay, uh, I like the fact, as you can see on the lower part here, that the Harvard president, Charles William Elliott, was all against the Morrill Act and spreading this university education across the country. Uh, 
I marvel at his quote as to how what's wrong with this subsidizing process is that it saps the foundations of liberty. What, uh, what are we talking about here, sapping the foundations of literacy, uh, liberty? And, but as I also would like to note, his father as treasurer of Harvard constantly tried to beg more subsidies out of the state of Massachusetts and then just finally got shot down. <laughs> okay, so it's all relative. Uh, here is that graph that I have. It's the best way I can run the data up to 1996 with some data series and a little bit of uh, differential, hard to compare series after that. But if you look at this, you can see how we have moved over these two centuries, or century and a half. We've moved toward government a lot. From my 1850 and 1860 data, which I have worked up from some raw census materials, we, these curves shift downward, which is to say the top share grows enormously, which is the share coming from government, not tuition and fees. That is thanks to the Morrill Act in particular and the uh, acts after it that funded universities. Okay, and then there was some jiggling around. Uh, the GI Bill also made uh, us become much more public. Uh, and into the post-war period there, there's some creep back, but you can see these events, or we can remember these events uh, in the post-war period, which is the GI Bill was made our national education extremely publicly funded, even at private universities. Sputnik 1957 and the national defense argument really played into the hands of the higher education lobby. Uh, I was a huge beneficiary of this. Thanks to something called the National Defense Education Act, by making mathematical economics one of my fields of study, I defended the nation. You should feel uh, that you can sleep more easily, <laughs> thanks to my mathematical economics. And, <laughs> pardon? And, and, or sleep. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a wonderful time. Oh, just uh, tremendous subsidies. And the baby boom, the education lobby really put it together. Uh, the higher education lobby in the 60s, they really had the formula. Uh, and it's been quite different since. Meanwhile, on the private side, these huge contributions from the newly rich post-war uh, donors, uh, getting their charitable deductions, etc. Now, can we sustain all this? Let me uh, put before you these questions that I'd uh, like you to discuss. First, with the one that is most like uh, a point from me, and not just uh, an invitation to your discussion. Could the public universities go on funding themselves like this? Well, you know, in the year 2010, we have immediate crises, and it's as if money actually has to be now, this year, so our rate of discount is, is, looks high at the moment. But overall, for sure we could. Uh, the OECD has been studying this and picking up on a point that I've been able to find for some other past episodes of history as well. The government makes out extremely well if we were to give you a grant for your higher education and if a large share of you stay in the state. Okay. They will make it back on tax revenues thereafter. The rate of return that they get is quite good. It's well above uh, 5% uh, for, for even the average of private and public together and across the several countries that the OECD has been able to study last year. So the government really gets its money back, even if it wasn't a loan, even if it was like Pell Grants uh, for the nation or the counterpart uh, state uh, scholarships, et cetera, for low-income students uh, at, the, at the state level. They do get the money back. So that's going to be especially true now more than, that might not have been so obvious uh, before the post-war period, but now we have these two trends that have really made that quite true. Government is a bigger share of our lives, even in America. And so uh, tax collecting is up, and so a, a higher share of your extra earnings will go to the government than was true for your great-grandparents. And higher rates of labor force participation by women mean that women too will be more uh, visibly and clearly taxed uh, for their extra earnings because they'll have a lot of extra earnings. Okay, in fact, if you can stick out the short-run crisis, uh, state government can, uh, 
by continuing to fund the rising educational attainments, pay for the, uh, some of its other problems, like the medical and pension bills. Uh, there's this curse of long life demography that makes those increasingly expensive. But with the universities, uh, you can actually get back some of this revenue. Uh, a study by, that I've cited on the list by Bomir Lee and others uh, show that, in fact, under certain plausible conditions about how you actually make the budgets balance across the 21st century, the extra education that is likely to come about with public subsidy, et cetera, will give government the revenue back to hold down the extent to which it would have to slash the other more age-related programs. So other possibilities? Uh, the state universities have, in some cases, been told to set sail and privatize more. Uh, in, there's a push factor in many cases, and that's true of us. Uh, when the state treasurer came to talk at Davis, uh, he said, uh, well, we're, gonna, we're facing the following budget prospects, and we're not going to be able to give you what we gave you before. And somebody asked, well, does that mean you're privatizing us? He says, no, I don't want to use the word privatize. And so then my colleague Ann Stevens of economics said, OK, well, here's a different word. How about abandon? Uh, and that's you know, largely what's happening. Uh, the, the game is largely up. We are losing that state money. Fortunately, in the UC system, the state money was only a quarter of their budget in the first place because they get so much from federal and other sources, and they even have an endowment. Uh, question, and then, then the pull factor. I mean, there's always this tug of war, and I can't figure out the optimal finance for a university of this. Do you like the selectivity game, where you try to play that game and get up into those ranks and actually be able to charge higher tuition that way? Or do you want to continue serving the larger, broader public by giving the, the students a much cheaper and better deal? So uh, the, the way I uh, pose it here is, could the University of Oregon charge as much as Indiana or Michigan as Oregon does not at the present? Uh, Oregon charges less. We are, after you are, after all, a destination state. People will tend to move this way more than they'll move toward Indiana. Uh, couldn't you charge what Indiana charges? Turning around, of course, and giving fellowships, et cetera, to anybody whose uh, family income doesn't uh, you know, meet a certain level, uh, as everyone will do, as Harvard does a lot, for example. OK, there's clearly going to be rising inequality in resources per student. Uh, the winners will take all. There may be some limits, but basically it's projected by the experts that the inputs per student are going to go on being more and more unequal uh, up and down the ranks. And then I have this final puzzle for you. You may have not have known the premise to my question, which is that the public universities in the West are giving the students a better deal. We can look at that figure E. You could now, or I will come to it uh, on the screen in the moment as my final uh, slide. Is it easier or harder for us as public universities here than for others in the East to um, make these adjustments? over time and decide what to do about tuition, uh, given uh, limits on state funds. To what extent should we, now here's the other question that I, I can't figure out. Now if I pose this question, I may be posing a choice between what is sort of the common wisdom and uh, an unusual alternative. It's not that I'm pushing for the unusual alternative. I just want, uh, as in the spirit of uh, the Vada lecture, I just want this good question about public uh, performance to be out there. Should you be giving better deals to in-state versus out-of-state students? Should you, how should those changes go? Now, politically, it's a slam dunk. You need, the university system absolutely needs its in-state middle class backing. Continue to give, charge the in-state students less. You can have the usual rhetoric about, oh, we are taxpayers, et cetera. Well, mm. You could, it wasn't your parents, but anyway. Um, that there's the usual feeling that you kind of need to do it to keep the uh, constituency there. That certainly works in California, where uh, the UC system and all three systems, with their half million students, uh, are a major lobby and a real sacred cow until this year. Uh, but there's this, uh, what, I call, what in public finance you call the Ramsey tax principle which would have said, gee, why didn't you do the opposite? Do you want to actually increase the productivity of the state and therefore the tax take of 
state government in Salem from all of the fruits of all of this education. The Ramsey principle in taxation is to get maximum revenue, which is going to be tied to the productivity of the people who graduate and stay in the state. You put the higher tax on those who are less elastic, less likely to move away, and a lower tax on attracting others and keeping others who might move in. So that would argue for giving the break to the out-of-state students. We do the opposite, not just here, in every state. We give a better uh, break to the in-state students. Question, for comparable in parental income and ability, et cetera, what is that optimization, that balance between the two? I, I know that university administrators have got this figured out. They've all done something that looks that must be very clever, but I can never figure out exactly how they decide these things, aside from the fact that I know that there's a political effect in favor of in-state students. So here was that final uh, display for you. Student tuition, what share do the students pay in tuition of their current, of the current operating costs of their campuses, which still excludes um, the value of the land and the equipment? Okay, well, the pink ones are the ones that give the students a better deal. And you can see the percentages in the legend. And there's a complicated pattern, but basically the western states are giving a better deal all along. I'm not quite sure what to make of that fact. But again, that question, um, would you want to emulate Indiana and Michigan and charge more? University of Michigan in that case, uh, not uh, Michigan State and the others. Uh, at the Ann Arbor flagship, uh, or not. Uh, what is the actual trade-off between in-state and out-of-state, between admitting more students or keeping the class sizes smaller? These are fascinating issues that I've not seen the answers to yet, uh, despite my reading, and they're the kinds of issues that I think are very much like what uh, Harold and John have been writing about. Thank you. Oh, uh, well, we have, sorry, we have mics. Uh, one mic, another mic is coming across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you could shout. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Good question. Uh, how should the subsidy vary by field of, uh, when some fields lead to more income later than others? Mostly you can't do that. It's, it's just not practical uh, because the students have to have choice. Uh, they will switch majors. Do they lose their subsidy by getting out of engineering? Um, I started in physics and bailed. Uh, some of the others of you that I, and the faculty that I talked to were originally uh, engineering types and bailed and went into econ. Econ is full of refugees from engineering and science. Now should we, should, uh, should there be a differential tuition? That's a very hard contract, almost like indentured servitude, uh, et cetera, to enforce. Uh, you, you would feel there was a, a, a case for it only if you were really, really bound to the economic return to the state, et cetera, then you say, oh, it's engineers we want to pay the money for, et cetera. Ah. But that's, that's, a, that's a bit narrow, especially since those who major in philosophy and classics and music, my, sort of three favorite examples of mine, because almost nobody does, but they turn out to be very good students because I've studied their high school performance. They're actually a very, those few people are actually very good. They probably go on to very successful high paying careers, but you won't know it in any easily measured way because it's such a small field. You gotta give too much choice. By the way, the only fascinating case, I, might this ever happen in Oregon? There's this one unique case beloved to many of us here, which is Cornell, the weirdest case of all. 
It's half public, half private. And the tuition is radically different. If you want engineering, liberal arts, etc., you're going to pay through the nose, top dollar. Now, what the state side has done for the in-state students only is they have all the same majors in disguise, but you can pay, you can pay less for them. So my daughter-in-law went through human development, because she's from New York State, and paid one-fifth of the tuition that she might have paid in psychology, uh, et cetera, for the econ departments and the social departments and so on. There's all these, and it's so weird. And when you switch, uh, dear mom and dad, <laughs> I really want to major in psychology, you know, and that's going to cost you, you know, sort of thing. But um, as a practical matter, it's very hard. There's just too much choice that should be involved. I guess I wouldn't go for it, you know. Yeah. Well, Billy, I'd like to come with that chart, mm -hmm. and I would, of course, as a good economist, think that states, anyone their right mind would like to get out of, such as a South Dakota, yeah. shouldn't have a very high level of subsidy to keep them there. And states would want to uh, move to, like California, which is not handy, and muscle builders, governor, and other uh, mergers. We don't see that. Now, here's the problem. Uh, here's one problem. Uh, and, and, and see, and like you, I, I exactly puzzle about this. One problem is you know, the economists would immediately say, well, wait a minute now. It doesn't depend on the level, it depends on the elasticity. So if South Dakota were to have changed, would those people leave anyway? In which case, they just lost their money on subsidizing more tuition and they. they they got their U-Haul van and left anyway, you know. So it's all about elasticities, you know, of migration. Would you, uh, and now South Dakota probably, should they give an out-of-stater a good deal? You think, well, they have to give them a really good deal. <laughs> well, I won't finish that sentence. Uh, but, but, but hang on, um, why bother? You know, it all depends on the elasticity. How many people would you attract? And would they stay in South Dakota for their career? Or having met their sweetheart, or whatever, you know, in South Dakota. There are. No <laughs> uh, we have it on high authority that there are no sweetheart Lutherans. Okay. <laughs> uh, see, so I like. I honestly put this up here as a puzzle. It's not like I knew the answer, but I'm going to tease you with it. You know, I don't know the answer, um, but I want you to know that. Others have gone the other way now, and I could, and I actually have with me a news clipping where we have exactly this issue being duped out about privatizing the UC, and the uh, their model is Michigan. Now, Michigan as a whole system is not the most uh, expensive, but Ann Arbor for sure is. Ann Arbor is basically private. Uh, you're paying for a, a, a large share, and, and they have a big endowment, so they look like a private, huh? They look like a private university, very much. Publicly affiliated is the phrase. Uh, now, could the, now U of O, uh, back to my question. You're a destination state. People who are here gonna stay here in large share. And people who might come in from out of state might stay here in large share. Um, But see, but then the trouble is it depends on the elasticities. Would, how much would they differ? Would the ones stay here only if you didn't charge them? See, we, I actually don't know the answer to that question. And I just wonder how administrators talk about this stuff. Every, every campus must have had, or yeah, every system at least must have had this discussion. And in fact, they have people hired, like Harriet Fishlow used to be the demographer for the, for the University of California system. They have people hired to work on this. <laughs> I don't know what they do. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. So uh, it's, it's kind of a. I want to talk about Portland State a little bit. Okay. There's various points of reference. I think that I want to. Uh, and if you're an advice giving, I don't know if we're paying you to be a consultant or not, but uh, it may be helpful. So but first, I want uh, where the data comes from here. Uh, I'm going to present some other data, and that's from the Delta Project. And I'm not sure this is the same. 
This is a national. That's NCES. Yeah, this is right. national. This is national. This is a national data gathering. Yeah. Report that. So mm -hmm. in Oregon, so using this, for instance, uh, for Portland State, mm -hmm. the the data for 2007 of the of the per student cost of of our operating revenue. 70% of that is paid by students. 30% comes from the state subsidy. That's the answer. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So it's it's this it's a 70-30 ratio for Portland State. That so that comes from the from some mm -hmm. Delta data that that we wow. are working with. So I want to say that. But this but mm -hmm. the second piece of this it relates to something you talked about earlier, that we rank in uh, Oregon uh, at a, about, we're about fourth from the bottom on the per student expenditures if, if you, on a national scale. So, so the, the, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, this takes us with a lot of direction. So mm -hmm. the point is whether you, whether you, it's the combination of state subsidy and tuition ranks us in terms of our investment on a per student basis very close to the bottom of 50 states. So what, what we're not doing hmm. is something you talked about earlier. We're, both we're not charging much tuition, nor do we have much of a state subsidy. Uh -huh which has to have some relationship with perceptions and reality about quality. The, I mean, I would assume. Yeah. Now, uh, and I haven't seen how the Delta figures were put together, so I can't uh, you know, lean too hard on the 70-30. Uh, you are extremely endowment poor, right? And, very, and uh, we are, now, University of Oregon is not. I mean, that's yeah. so part of the difference mm -hmm. of thinking about our future mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. something you, you suggested yeah. in your, so yeah. those places with endowments, yeah. and the University of Oregon is a wonderful example of that. Right. So they've essentially adopted a strategy of mm -hmm. recruiting out-of-state students that they then, they don't, they don't give them tuition remissions, what they do is give them scholarships out of the endowment. So in fact, you collect the revenue on a per student basis. You, you jack up your, your revenue, even though they get, they get less of a state subsidy than we do on a per student basis at the University of Oregon, but, given, but a substantially different yeah, given the endowment, uh, et cetera. revenue base yeah. on, a, on a per student basis right. because of their endowment. At, at a place like Portland State, as we right. think about our, our future, right. we, uh, we rank uh, substantially lower than the University of Oregon on a per student revenue base. Right. Because we get about, we get slightly more than they do on a per student base from the state, mm -hmm. but we get substantially less on a Overall. per student base on based on tuition because A, we don't have as many out of state or international students, mm -hmm. nor do we have the ability to subsidize. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where okay. I'm going with this. Well, that's okay. I, uh, you're going, I, I can think of one thing uh, that it helps us to focus on as uh, an immediate ch challenge, but with some hope. Uh, there's a slight silver lining. This is a very big cloud, but there's a slight silver lining here, which is one problem that Davis and Portland State have had is that I think the donors have held off because they say, well, look, you know, why should I, with my donation, displace state money? Well, if the game's over on state money, <laughs> as it certainly is getting to be for us, it's more credible for your development office now to go to the donors and say, look, it's you or nothing, which is, you know, which is now becoming true. I don't want to say you can jump fast with these things because hey, Harvard is three centuries old, you know, uh, this, this doesn't move fast. But uh, you may have a little bit more credibility w when approaching the donors saying, look, uh, this is your school or it isn't there. Uh, that's, I think, more credible in the near future. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, somebody who has next yeah, way back. Uh, I'm okay. What, what, you were heading for somebody. Go ahead. But you're not turned on. <laughs> Should I go ahead? Sure. Um, uh, John, I, okay. I love your example about the tax revenue openly paying for subsidies yeah. to students, even for grants. Um, it seems like that. First of all, that sort of shows you that it's potentially an investment rather than a current expenditure. Yeah. So it might be worthwhile to raise a state bond or something to pay for this sort of thing, because it will just do, particularly to highlight the fact that it will yeah. be paid yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, but I was wondering if this is widely known, if it has any political purchase. Um, it should be. So the OECD is publishing, publicizing this now. We could ask them to break it down by public versus private universities. So, uh, and but. Let's see now, who else has uh, I'll try to think of somebody that said it. This needs to be given more purchase. Uh, this point is just lost. Uh, then, first of all, uh, we live in a political climate where there's only a certain share of the population that would ever conceive of there being any such thing as a public investment at all of any kind. Uh, we, we're familiar with that phenomenon. But uh, there is, for sure there is. And uh, just like national defense, this is something with a payoff. Um, this one, a very visible uh, fiscal payoff, even. Uh, that point should be thumped. Yeah. Uh, Jamie is uh, empowered here, I think. <laughs> and I now have a functioning microphone. OK. Uh, I want to go back to um, the inability of capital markets to yeah. handle this particular problem. and. You did point out that it was difficult to enforce these kind of ownership arrangements. Even though there are a couple of firms out there right now that are doing it, I found one that's called the Thrust Fund. But beyond just this idea of purchasing shares in a person, there is also uh, something that's called a uh, income contingent loan. And this was something that was actually implemented in Yale. Tobin did it in yeah. 1970s. Right. And eventually they stopped it just because the folks that were graduating just got so rich, they just decided to default instead. And there are a couple of other countries that are doing <laughs> similar things. Um, so Australia has a system where you go, you don't pay anything, and once your income reaches a certain level, then effectively you start paying back the loan. And so this is a, a, a again, it's, it's not strictly buying shares of a person's income, but it is one of these derivatives that could be used in order to fund education. And I apologize if I start looking like the market solve all problems guy here. Well, but this, uh, we, we accept the principle. We like that. Uh, as long as it's enforced right and these people don't run away or misstate their income, then this sharecropping arrangement, uh, it looks pretty good. You know, I mean, that's, that's reasonable. Uh, but you almost, Jamie, you almost get it anyway, Jamie. You almost get it automatically anyway, right? If the income tax, if the, well, if the, uh, certainly at the federal level, if the income tax is a certain, certain share of your income, as it is with the state a little bit too, their take is going up with your income in any case. It's not maybe as progressive as what some people had in mind, but there's already an automatic mechanism built into the system. So it's, it doesn't require wisdom. It's, it's sort of in the system now, I think, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Okay, there's the loan, well, the loan component, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's right, okay. Uh, post baby boomers carry significant student loans, that's right. Um, it's, a default issue. John, he, he uh, who hasn't asked one yet, I'm, I'm discriminating against you if I can. There you go. <laughs> Just a simple question. From your perspective in California, given the budget constraints there, it appears that you're shrinking the system and giving up incremental revenue. Is, is that a stable situation or is it a downward spiral? We, we seem to be adopting a somewhat different strategy. So could yeah. you kind of make sense of that one for me? It's uh, my, the implication of my remark that uh, John Gallup was picking up on is that it's a downward spiral because you're going to lose uh, some of this education in the long run too. But in the economist terms, the trouble with California is now its rate of discount is so high. <laughs> they, they're living from hand to mouth because they could go bankrupt. I mean, their credit rating has already gone down for California, for City of Los Angeles, and for others. Uh, they're in so much short-run trouble. They're in that 
they share that feature with the poor of the world uh, that they they don't they're losing credit and they can't wait long enough for those revenues to come in when these people mature and earn i think it's probably uh, politics is always myopic but especially now so they may fail to honor this point i'm sorry john go ahead <laughs> uh, it seems to me the externality literature is perfectly clear you're agency which deals with an externality has to cover the whole of the area that's why the whole world has to deal with the global warming thing right but only the city has to deal with the sewer uh, given the mobility of americans uh, it seems to me what you had what what your entire argument ends with is you need a federal subsidy to higher education uh, i know that you know that mm -hmm. gets a lot of people upset but We've had, actually, we have a lot of federal subsidy to higher education and have for many years. Yeah. Uh, but a, th this externality mm -hmm. one, sure. I see no other way to address it. And I So Pell Grants should be big. Should be what? Big. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for example. Yeah, uh, and, and that's. probably easy to get. Huh? Big and easy to get. Yeah, big and easy to get, and, you know, for anybody with any, meets any kind of reasonable yeah. income test. Yeah. Because should the be. Will get the benefit yeah. From the education, but, well, I think uh, so. Uh, I think that's that's clear uh, to me. Uh, it's not popular with everybody. Uh, there is a question way back here, I know. And then, if if you want to go to your guy for, and then you you have a question there for. I can yeah. talk really loud. Okay. Um, so can I. I was wondering with the. Uh, I mean, you have to start with the twist or the amount of women being covered by. Oh, sorry. Or was it subsidies? We were getting more and more subsidies, and the amount of tuition we were paying was getting lowered by a percentage. I was wondering how that compared to the rising rate of tuition, because we may be paying less, but we're still going to have to lower it in our future, even with the tuition, I mean, with the subsidies, etc. Okay, so it's a you're asking about the race between how fast the subsidies are going and how fast what you're actually paying is going. So uh, in that figure C, do I want to say here? I think. She has that for some of these, and by the way, there is a, uh, and if I seem to be going back to this one particular source here, uh, I've been looking around, there's, this is, these data are actually hard to get, and so there's only been a couple studies, uh, things like this, uh, which get at that question. Now, for, in your, the, the way you asked the question, your, what you're paying is going up faster than the subsidy is going up if this rises, if this curve rises. Now, they're not clearly rising, and the ones for the most selective colleges are falling. So that the subsidy for them was going up faster than what the students were paying. Oh, and I'm sorry, what the students were paying, if I ever refer to that, uh, the tuition, you know, I'm not talking about the sticker price. 6,000, so what's, what's that? What's that number? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that minus the... Um, scholarships, et cetera. It's the net. Now, that net has not been going up for the selective colleges and for some of these others in her graph as fast as others. Since 1996, what you, the, uh, the news headline skyrocketing tuition cost of college is slower than the rise of the subsidies up to 2006 or seven. Then came the financial bust for the privates, so I'm, that may have stabilized. The subsidies may have cooled off a bit. But uh, that is uh, that for that particular decade of boom from the mid-90s to the middle of this decade was so strong that this is why the Senate, uh, the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, began to start to have hearings investigating Shouldn't they putting, be putting new taxes on Harvard and the others? And Harvard's response, seeing this coming, was, oh, hang on, we'll, give, we'll give everybody a free education to Harvard and just be very selective. Uh, but then Harvard lost its money on the hedge funds. And so, so the subsidies did outrun the tuition for the top places, maybe overall, from mid-1990s to the mid-2000s. Over the long haul, if you go back to an earlier graph of mine, figure D, I'm sorry, later graph, uh, figure D, then uh, you'll see actually uh, for the post-war period there was a creeping up. The tuition being paid by students was getting to be a, a rising share of the total for, for the country as a whole. 
But in the last 10 or 15 years, it came down. The subsidies were outrunning the tuition. No, there are none that apply that. Uh, no state would uh, charge the in-staters more than the out-of-state to lure the out-of-staters. Nobody, it's a, it's a reasonable economic possibility, but everybody thinks of the political argument, which is, look, we've, who votes on this issue as to what the state puts up? <laughs> who votes? Excuse me, they're all in-state. And so, it's just like uh, there, there's a differential franchise. The people out of state who might be interested in this issue can't, can't vote on it. So the favor, every state favors the in-state students and charges them a lower tuition. It's just like uh, growth controls in a, in a suburb like mine, which is extremely exclusive. We've got our property in this nice town. Now we want to pull up the ladder. Um, the people who might want to move there have no vote. That would be the, res the real estate analogy to this. Only the people in Oregon can vote on this issue, and guess which way they would prefer. Yeah. Um, so I know America is really a very popular destination for international students to come to school. And as I know, a lot of them, they pay a high premium tuition than uh, out-of-state or in-state students, and they don't receive scholarships or any other uh, financial subsidies. Uh, how would the uh, trend of international students coming to the U.S. affect um, the future sustainability or um, the funding or revenues for these colleges? For a while, admitting them and, you, and possibly even admitting them with a little bit of a softening of the tuition because there may be an elasticity here. But admitting the foreign students is a, a cash cow for the American universities for a while. That is gonna stop in about 20 some odd years because the Europeans and the Asians and others are so rapidly improving their universities that there will be more um, balance and they won't all just come here. Uh, we and the British are making some money off the foreign students our ability to extract that may decline. Our correct policy about how to set that out-of-country tuition, again, depends on these elasticities unknown to me. Uh, the, other, uh, the other interesting phenomenon that you, uh, there's so many issues about the international university students that are just so interesting to study, one of which is, what's the long-run dynamic of a developing country that is successfully growing and catching up? Uh, in terms of whether it should send students to U.S. and Britain or not, or in Japan. Now, you know, the most interesting case by far is the People's Republic of China. They, starting in the 1980s, paid a ton of money of their own. They also got some help from the Americans, but they paid a lot of money of their own to send their students to North America, Britain, Japan. A huge share initially of them stayed and did not go back. They might be sending remittances to relatives, but they did not go back. And so in the short run, China, you, you might have thought, maybe didn't get such a good deal. But we've already gone over to the other side of the curve for China. So many go back to China because the prospects there are good, that China is getting probably a very high rate of return on the scholarships it gave to the students to leave China for university. That's probably worked out very well. For engineering, economics, the things that China would have invested in. But it, it's such a fascinating question. Like, if you were that country, what should be your policy? And, and an example I've liked to use is suppose you were, say, a country sort of in the English language zone, but developing. Suppose you were Trinidad and Tobago. Should you pay to develop the university in your own country? Should you pay for scholarships so that they can go to Britain? Uh, for their higher education. Guyana does, I'm uh, sorry, Guyana uh, educates them locally. But should Trinidad do that? Uh, a third possibility is what, to what extent should you try to pay premia to hire foreign faculty? Uh, this, is, this is fascinating. Uh, how you develop a university given that you are not the leader now. Um, it's kind of like uh, the 19th century, etc. the Western states trying to catch up. It was very difficult. They got a lot of subsidies. Quick footnote, even 
there's a sense in which even Stanford got some subsidies. Stanford is strictly private money in its origins, sort of, except that Leland Stanford got those government land grants at these incredibly, <laughs> incredibly dirt cheap prices. And so is that public money or is that private money? Thank you all for good questions.